Good morning. I take it from your presence here that you're not out running the marathon this morning. I had several people tell me last night we were at uh, Elk Grove for their 35th anniversary uh, anniversary meal, and uh, several people tell me that they were not going to be here th this morning because they live right on Fair Oaks, and they can't get out of their driveway <laughs> for a while, not until later on this morning. Oh, well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. A short passage this morning. A few comments. Being blind in a traditional peasant culture like this meant basically the end of your life. Whatever brought about his blindness, whether he was born blind or, or whatever, we don't know. No work, no hope. You begged for money. And begging was a shame. The crowd we notice in the gospel reading is less than sympathetic. Oftentimes, people in traditional cultures are not sympathetic with the disabled. They assume that people who are disabled are disabled because of something bad they did, or whatever. Of course, not necessarily. Perhaps this man has heard some news about Jesus. Perhaps he suspects that this prophet from Nazareth might be the Messiah, whatever he thinks. Perhaps he's heard about Jesus' healings. The literary context that Luke gives us for this story is very important. The previous story in the gospel is the story of the rich young ruler. He looks very pious, but he can't bring himself to follow Jesus. We expect him to do the right thing. He seems to be a good person, but he does not. His riches are too important. Then the following story in Luke's gospel is about Zacchaeus, the chief, chief tax collector. He looks impious, he looks evil, but he repents, he surprises us. We don't expect much from him, but we get a lot. The disciples ask the question at the end of Jesus' discourse with the rich young ruler, because they're surprised at his words that rich people can't be saved. <laughs> he says, easier to, for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle at all. This is, this is difficult for them. Who then can, then they ask him the question, who then can be saved? Who can be saved? And of course, Jesus' answer, he says, with men, this is not possible. But with God, what's the end of the phrase? All things are possible. The following stories help answer this most important cosmic question. The wealthy young ruler no, too attached to his wealth to be saved. Zacchaeus, also rich in contrast, wants to be saved. He'll take whatever steps are necessary to achieve that goal. He gives away half his estate. He makes amends for cheating people. He's cheated people. Zacchaeus is the answer to the rich young ruler who should have made Jesus some sort of offer and did not, didn't bother. And then in between is this story of this blind man. Here's the analogy the fathers would give us. One of the ways of talking about salvation is illumination, regaining our sight. Salvation is forgiveness of sins, it's cleansing, it's being made right in God's sight, it's being freed from the guilt and power of sin, it's being adopted into God's family, made his child, born from above. It's being given true spiritual sight. Being a sinner in this world is being blind to the realities of God. It's being blind to spiritual things. It's not seeing, it's not knowing the truth. It's not knowing God, the ultimate reality. We talk about baptism as illumination, regaining our sight. We talk about the process of salvation as first purification from sin, and then secondly, illumination, Gaining insight, gaining the ability to see and understand spiritual things. And then finally, theosis, becoming divine, sharing in the energies of God. There's nothing like being able to see. I ran across this story. Pastor Max Lucado tells a story. For 51 years, 
Bob Edens was blind. He couldn't see a thing. His world was a black hall of sounds and smells. He felt his way through five decades of darkness. And then he could see. A skilled surgeon performed a complicated operation, and for the first time, Bob Edens had his sight. He found it overwhelming. I never would have dreamed that yellow is so yellow, he exclaimed. I don't have the words. I'm amazed by yellow. Red is my favorite color. I just can't believe red. I can see the shape of the moon. And I like nothing better than seeing a jet plane flying across the sky, leaving a vapor trail. And of course, sunrises and sunsets. And at night, I look at the stars in the sky and the flashing light. You could never know how wonderful it all is. Perhaps if we've never been blind, we'd never know the beauty around us. Salvation is that way. Gaining a glimpse of the glory of God. Back to the question, who can be saved? Who then can be delivered from sin and death and judgment? Here are a couple of simple answers, simple answers from this gospel reading. Who can be saved? The person who recognizes his need. The problem is we think that we can see things as they are, but often we have no, reality, no idea what reality is. If we could see ourselves for just a moment the way God sees us, then we'd have true self-knowledge. We also would never, probably never recover from the shock. God does help strip away our illusions and our self-delusions. God does help us to know ourselves. In fact, we cannot know ourselves apart from God. There is a, there is a saying among psychologists, people in social science, that you cannot know yourself apart from others. We need other people to learn about ourselves. But we would say further than that, we need to know God to know who we are. We cannot know who we are until we come face to face with Christ. Often we don't see ourselves in need. We like to think that we're strong and competent, but the reality is more complicated. We realize our need for, for God from time to time when things don't go well for us, when we get sick, etc. We start wondering about the meaning of our lives, about our salvation and our destiny. The truth is we just need God all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Second, who can be saved? The person who seeks God with his whole heart. The man in the, in the gospel story will not be put off. Nothing will stop him. Even the people around him telling him to shut up doesn't make any difference. We all sometimes just go through the motions. This is not the best, but it's better than nothing. God wants our sincere devotion, as sincere as we can be, as real as we can be. God looks at our hearts, the inner core of our being. He wants our attention. He wants from us genuine sorrow for our sin and real humility and faith and love. Who can be saved? The person who believes in spite of opposition. What kind of opposition to our relationship to God do we encounter? A lot. A lot of things to keep us, to keep us away from God. Ourselves sometimes. Our pride, our self-delusion. In this culture, oh my goodness, distraction. Wait, I think I'm, I think I'm getting a call. Seduction. If we're all to be successful at being Christians, we must work to put our lives in an order that asserts our real priorities. We must make choices. If I'm a Christian, then God is always first, and then my family, and then my job, and then other things. I do not put myself first. I know that I have to pursue a relationship with the living God above all else. I need to know God. Fourth, who can be saved? The person who perseveres in prayer. The man in the gospel story perseveres. God calls us together to pray. Sometimes we rush through and minimize our time in church, but this time in church on Sunday morning, right now, where we are, present right here, right here and now, 
this is the most important time in our week. This sets the, the course, this sets the tone, this lays the foundation for the rest of the week. This is the best time. This is the first day of the week. These are the first hours of the first day of the week. We're up, and where do we go? We go to church. We encounter God. God calls us to pray even when the answers don't come right away, even when God doesn't respond to us. And God calls us to pray unceasingly. This kind of prayer calls, calls us to find a place in us, the heart, the place that stands apart from our constant and often troubling thoughts, the place of silence and peace, the place where God can and will meet with us. Here, prayer becomes silence. It's listening to God. And then, of course, lastly, who can be saved? We know the answer. The person who believes. Jesus tells the formerly blind man who now is going to go, have to go through, through rehab and career counseling to find his new course in life because now he's no longer a beggar. Alms for a former blind man. No, no, no. Won't work. Who can be saved? The person who simply believes. Your faith has saved you. Jesus tells him, salvation is really about just trusting God day in and day out. Let me conclude. What I'm presenting you today is in contrast with the contemporary, mostly evangelical Protestant approach to salvation, the TV programs, the evangelistic crusades. Pray this prayer. Ask Jesus to save you. Confess that you're a sinner. Ask him to save you. You hear this on TV if you, if you listen. We would say that praying and asking God to save you is a good beginning. There's also a bit of American sales and marketing here. Praying a prayer once does not create a relationship with God. God is not going to give us a ticket to get into his heaven. I've got my ticket. Sorry. By the way, how do you know how do you have assurance that you'll make it into the kingdom? When you stand before Christ someday, as we all will, why will he let you in? Why will he let me in? Do I have any assurance of that? Do I know where I'm going? The tra traditional Orthodox or Catholic approach to salvation is much more organic and relational. Salvation is a relationship not a sales transaction. I don't pray a prayer and get salvation. I pray a prayer, and that's the beginning of a relationship with God. And if I persevere in that relationship, God will save me. We need to follow Christ. We need to be part of a community, the church. We need to persevere in our faith in God. We always pray for forgiveness and for mercy and for grace. We never simply assume that we are going to pass the judgment successfully. We're not absolutely assured that we're going to be saved. I think such knowledge would be dangerous for any human being. It would take the grace of God for granted. Some assurance of our salvation comes from our relationship with God. The more you walk with Christ, the more you attend to him, the more you pray, the more you give yourself to him, the more you follow the commandments, the more you love, the more you learn to love, the more assurance will grow in your heart. Peace, the peace that passes all understanding. This morning, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved? I want to be saved. I don't want to be like the rich young ruler and be attached to material things. I want to be like Zacchaeus and show my repentance. I want to be like the blind man and know that in myself and without God and his grace, I am blind and I want to pray with my whole heart and trust in God and receive spiritual sight. I want to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of time. I want to stand before him and hear him say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your reward. That should be the uppermost thing on our minds in this life. Amen. Please stand.